Hi everybody and welcome to the Biodiversity Information Standards TIDWIG 2020 conference. Uh, this session, PD02, is called Biocultural Labels Initiative, Supporting Indigenous Rights in Data Derived from Genetic Resources. And I'm your moderator, Jane Anderson. And I'm here uh, in Lenape Hoking, the lands of the Lenape Nations in New York, USA. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the ancestors and paying my respects to the past, present and future Indigenous leaders of these lands. I'm joined by co-moderator Maui Hudson from Aotearoa, New Zealand, and we're really grateful for the technical support of Gail Kampmeyer and Kate Ingenloff from the USA. We're also really grateful to Tuti Nikora for moderating the chat for us. This session will be recorded for later viewing. Thank you so much for joining us in this session, and thank you to all the speakers in this session as well. The chat function has been made available for technical questions or for conversing with other attendees. Please use this judiciously, as any nefarious or inappropriate use of the chat may result in you being removed from the session or the chat function being disabled. Uh, there's a code of conduct document that's going to be put into the, um, into the chat so you're aware of what that looks like for more information. Uh, during the session, you might ask questions in the chat while the speakers are presenting uh, or, or catch, capture them in the shared document that you will find the link to in the chat that's going to be put there by Libby now. Please keep your microphones muted. We'll have a discussion time before the end of the session. We're planning for speaking for about um, 35 to 40 minutes with a good 40 minutes for discussions and questions. Uh, during that time, you'll be able to speak if you wish, and if you'd like to, you, you can raise your hand from the, um, for those of you who are familiar with Zoom, the participants list menu, uh, you click more and then you have the raise your hand uh, option, or you can just type that into the chat. Um, before we begin, I'd like to uh, ask my co-moderator Maui Hudson to introduce himself, followed by our panellists. Over to you, Maui. Koto, um, just want to say uh, greetings here from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, my name's Maui Hudson. I work at the University of Waikato and have been one of the co-developers of the Biocultural Labels Initiative. Just want to acknowledge um, my affiliation to the Whakatohia Nation and that our university is sited on the, the lands of the Waikato Whainui. So kia ora. Great. Libby, could you introduce yourself? Kia ora Libby Liggins um, I'm here in Aotearoa, New Zealand as well, and my uh, role really is uh, as a biologist, molecular ecologist, and have become interested in the biocultural labelling um, initiative in my role as a researcher, so I'll offer that perspective today. Great. Thanks, Libby. John, could you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm John Deck with the uh, University of California, Berkeley, and Biocode LLC, and um, I work with uh, information systems and samples from the field to the lab and um, writing the I've written the geome software um, which we're going to talk about a little bit in this presentation great thanks john katie could you introduce yourself hi i'm katie barker i'm from the national museum of natural history in washington dc um, and i'm going to be here to talk a little bit about um, the Global Genome Biodiversity Network and TADWIG and GSC and how the standards align. I'd also like to uh, give a shout out to the local tribes from the DC area. Great. And Chris, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, thanks Jane. Uh, I'm Chris Meyer, I'm also from the National Museum here at the Smithsonian in DC. And I'm very interested in the uh, application of this and how we move forward doing responsible science. Thanks. Great. Um, thanks, everyone. Okay, so we're going to jump straight in. Maui, do you want to share your screen? All right, so we're going to do a little bit of an overview of the uh, traditional knowledge and biocultural labels initiative just for those who aren't familiar. I can see that there are some people on here who are joined who are familiar, um, but for many of you, this might be a new initiative. And so we wanted to uh, walk you through it a little bit and to understand uh, what we're trying to do with this particular uh, 
yeah, with this particular initiative. So I think uh, many of you would be very familiar with Creative Commons as a particular intervention in the field around intellectual property um, and understanding it as, a, as something that's trying to deal with uh, open access to information. Uh, information that's kept within a particular intellectual property framework. What we want to talk to you about today is really the movement from a legal framework of uh, copyright and intellectual property into a more extra legal framework, which is really where the labels and the notices that we've developed are, are uh, situated. And by extra legal, we mean kind of beyond the current standing of, uh, of, of, of the legal framework itself at the moment. So uh, to introduce you to this, we really want to talk a little bit about the problems in data information and infrastructures that we have uh, been dealing with, uh, particularly around Indigenous knowledge. Uh, as many of you would be aware, uh, every Indigenous community has enormous collections of uh, cultural knowledge and uh, data and uh, tangible and intangible collections that are held in archives, museums and libraries um, and other online databases and repositories. And the main problem that we encounter, particularly in all of our work with Indigenous communities, is that there are there is significant information that's missing from these collections uh, at a metadata level and at a provenance level and that means that it's, it, it creates different kinds of challenges as uh, people come to this data and think about how they're going to use it as well as for Indigenous communities getting access to that material. What we know is that uh, Indigenous peoples are largely not the legal rights holders, which really means that an initiative like Creative Commons can't actually help Indigenous communities in these contexts. And so we had to move to a different kind of initiative, which is really where we come in with the, um, with the labels and the notices. Um, we also know that there are more people working than ever before, more researchers working than ever before with uh, Indigenous communities. And so part of our uh, work here is trying to think about how can we create different kinds of research practices? How can we create transformative research practices that actually benefit Indigenous communities, recognise the failures historically in relationship to documenting properly Indigenous uh, knowledges and where that comes from and what that means for users moving forward. So the traditional knowledge labels were developed about 10 years ago uh, in response to these problems that Indigenous communities have within archives, libraries and museums. They really should be understood as digital tags that are machine readable. They help establish provenance for Indigenous data and they really are about creating durable and persistent cultural metadata. Uh, what's unique about the TK labels is that they allow for community control and definition through customization, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Um, at the moment, there's about 200 plus users, including communities and institutions across a wide variety of countries um, that are using these labels because they're starting to meet a particular need in relationship to how do we understand where data comes from, how do we understand where bio biological data comes from, how do we connect samples and specimens to communities, and what does that look like in terms of changing the research futures. So this is an example of one of the 18 labels. This is the label that is uh, usually developed first by any Indigenous community. And I should say that the labels are really a tool for Indigenous communities. Indigenous communities customise and develop the labels themselves and then share those labels with the institutions or with data repositories. And from an Indigenous standpoint, this label is probably one of the, is one of the first ones that gets developed partly because it actually brings Indigenous communities' names back into the public record. Those names have often been deleted, included in the first You were breaking up. To create, starts to create a different pathway for joining those dots together and allowing for co the correction of historical mistakes. 
This is an example of one of the uh, a, a, a traditional knowledge label that's being customized by a community. This is the skull lips band of the Stolo First Nation in British Columbia. Um, and this is their interpretation of what attribution is and means from their local context. Uh, attribution to skull lips really literally means name and place. Squicks quas tek tamuch. And it is about thinking through why that name has been erased and what it means to bring that name back in and for those stories to be told properly and for them to be respected. This is a seasonal label. This is another one of the 18 that we developed. Uh, and the labels have been developed in partnership with Indigenous communities, so different communities have uh, identified particular labels that need to be uh, part of the suite of labels that we have for the TK labels. This is an interesting label for our conversations, partly because it is a, it's the label that kind of crosswalks between traditional knowledge and biocultural labels in the sense that it connects knowledge to place, knowledge to land, knowledge to the environment, um, and that there are particular kinds of teachings that come out of place that are really important for making meaning about songs, about stories, about narratives. Um, so this is another important label that we have in our suite. So the, this is an example of, of, of one of the ways in which the TK labels have been uh, implemented into the Library of Congress. We wanted to give you a, a quick example of one of the one of one way of implementing the TK labels. This is uh, the Passamaquoddy, uh, sorry, I have, I have to say, I'm, I'm being really formal, but at the same time, I've been on Zoom for 12 hours, so I'm a little tired. Um, so please forgive me with my little breaks and thinking patterns that aren't working or aren't cogent uh, <laughs> as I'd like them to be. Um, so this is a Passamaquoddy war song. These were 31 wax cylinders that were uh, recorded in 1890 in... Uh, in on there were the first sound recordings that were made on native lands in the united states in 1890 there's 31 of them you can see from this record kind of the challenges that we're dealing with um, we know very little about the content of these recordings this was the uh online catalog record at the library of congress for these recordings you can see we we kind of know a lot about the technology we know how long the cylinder was. Um, we know who the rights holders are, and it's notable that it's not the Passamaquoddy. Um, but we know very little about the content. And so what this project really was about was establishing um, the relationships with the community as well as thinking about how can we enhance that metadata and make sure that there are the right relationships in place so that the Passamaquoddy feel that they can actually share their information and also that the public can get access to uh, what the Passamaquoddy want to share. So this next slide is what the updated record starts to look like. You can see that the title of the songs is also now in Passamaquoddy. That was very important. But you can see that the TK labels are uh, sitting there next to the content. It was very important to Passamaquoddy that the labels were not in a subject field buried down, <laughs> way down the line, but were actually as close to the content as possible asserting their authority and their continued authority over these songs. They are Passamaquoddy songs. They are not the songs that were um, uh, recorded by the researcher. Passamaquoddy decided on three labels that they wanted to have, the attribution, the outreach, and the non-commercial. And they're the three labels that you'll find on all of the songs that are in the um, Library of Congress from the Passamaquoddy at the moment. This project was significant partly because of the work that was needed to do to change the um, digital infrastructure of the um, institution as well. Uh, this is the JSON field for TK labels, which is now there for every item within the Library of Congress, which means that every community that has items in the Library of Congress could potentially add a TK label if they wanted to do that. The next major um, part of this is in relationship to the rights advisory. 
Uh, the rights advisory now recognises the labels as the first rights that are in the Library of Congress. You can see that the what's normally understood as the traditional copyright rights are at the very bottom uh, of the rights advisory and the TK labels, the attribution, outreach and non-commercial are the rights that are understood as kind of almost pre-existing. They, 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 they stand alongside before and after um, the legal rights of Harvard University. This has all also led to um, work around what that might mean within Dublin Core and where those uh, labels get placed. And this is something that we want to have a conversation with you today. These are all kind of the the kind of points of entry for our discussion later on is where where should these uh, labels go within Dublin Core? They've been placed in the rights field, um, and that is recognizing uh, the, the different kinds of um, ways in which the rights field has largely only been held for the legal rights holders. But what does that mean for different kinds of cultural rights, and where do they get placed within um, the the any kind of field? And then that's led to a larger conversation um, that has moved into different kinds of spaces around um, standards and what that means, which is kind of partly what we wanted to bring to you today. I'm going to hand over to Maui. Kilda, thanks, Jane. Um, so just what Jane's outlined there is um, what I was introduced to at the back end of projects I've been involved in around developing guidelines for Māori and genomic research and guidelines for biobanking with Māori as well. And so um, doing another uh, project at the moment that looks at genomic research in the context of Indigenous flora and fauna. So I've been actively involved in discussions about um, sort of the interface between uh, tribal communities and genomic scientists around the development of gen um, genetic research projects. Now, these same sorts of issues kept coming up around, you know, how uh, their rights and interests in relation to the, the digital sequence data or the genomic data um, uh, recognised, um, if not, if you know, not protected, and, and how that happens within an open data environment. You know that that's um, part of the open science and open data initiatives is to move access to those things into this open space and that inability to um, assert uh, a intellectual property or a form of um, uh, protection over the raw sequence data you find yourself in a very similar position to um, where indigenous communities find themselves in relation to their cultural heritage data and their traditional knowledge um, so that was the sort of immediate um, immediate similarity. So how can you share this digital sequence information and collaborate around ethical access and use in ways that are consistent with community protocols? And those things are really moving towards um, being in a position where you can then start to think about how do you negotiate equitable outcomes? And so that sort of uh, access and benefit sharing arrangements that would be in place uh, when you engage in a project where that's the intention from the beginning, it's quite clear how that can come about. But if we're engaging with a group that is doing something, uh, a project for a conservation purpose or a biodiversity purpose, um, we want to support that project, but the data ends up um, on an open platform where it can be accessed by anyone. If someone comes around to um, the, working out what a commercial application is, how then do they connect back with us? And I think that's the potential value we saw in the traditional knowledge labels and why we then started thinking about what could be done um, around biocultural labels. And so uh, down here in Aotearoa, we managed to get some funding from the Royal Society of New Zealand um, to establish a, a catalyst project and bring some people together, including Jane and John Deck um, working with Libby and myself and some others to try and think through what sorts of things would make sense in this kind of um, in this kind of space. And so our starting our start off set of labels are, uh, one a provenance label. So the provenance label is doing the same kind of thing as the attribution label, which Jane described around the traditional knowledge space. Um, a consent verified label. Uh, given it's always uh, 
nice to know that um, consent is in place, particularly for legacy samples. And we know that, you know, um, as uh, the expectations around um, what is appropriate in terms of consent has changed over time, sometimes um, older, older sample collections don't meet what would be considered best practice now. Uh, a, one difference between the traditional knowledge labels, which sort of looks back and thinks about what are the protocols that apply or did apply to, to that material is this is really about generating data which has a future use or you know specifically for a future use and thinking about the sort of relationship that the community might like to maintain with next users of that data so you know the idea that um, information can be for a research use and sort of unspecified research that even if it's available for unspecified um, specified research use they may still be open to collaboration and that collaboration might um, result in a number of different sort of benefits for both parties. And also whether or not they're open to commercialization, uh, given that there'll be some communities where um, that will be a possibility and others where it won't, but it can be really clear about um, where, that, where that might sit. And also the multiple community label, given that we know um, uh, you know, biological species don't restrict themselves to tribal boundaries um, and that there may be multiple communities that have uh, interests in a particular in a particular species. And so this is a way that a community can put labels on and that recognizes their own interests, but they can um, acknowledge that other people have a right to be involved in those kinds of conversations as well. So our example um, here, you see here's a, a why use this label in relation to provenance. Um, indigenous peoples have the right to make decisions about the future use of information, collections, data and digital sequence information that derives from their associated lands, borders and territories. This label supports the practice of proper and appropriate acknowledgement into the future. And so thinking about um, how the labels and what they do uh, align themselves with um, expectations for access and benefit sharing arising from the Nagoya Protocol. Um, in ways where the consent verified label can um, give an indication that free prior and conformed uh, consent has been sought, that there are labels there that that point towards what appropriate uses are. It might not quite extend to mutually agreed terms, but it certainly um, creates a foundation upon which those mutually agreed terms might be used uh, as, as data transfers from a kind of a research space into a, more of a commercial space. And the provenance of multiple community labels give a hint towards at least where the benefits should be shared. Um, if not the nature of the benefit, the benefit sharing itself, which would, which would come about from those conversations. And so while the, so while the labels are, uh, so while the labels are customized by the community and represent the authority from the community, the notices uh, have what been developed to be applied by the research or the institutions. So that you can recognize that there are these uh, interests or rights that need to be thought about or need to be applied. And you can start working on uh, creating the, the space within the digital infrastructures to allow uh, labels to emerge. So the notices themselves support this transparency and integrity in research. They make visible an institutional commitment to indigenous communities and the future use of that data. Uh, you'll see we've got here two types of notices. Obviously, the TK notice uh, is a precursor to the traditional knowledge labels and the BC notice a precursor to the bicultural labels. The other two are cultural institution labels, which allow the institution to recognize that they're open to collaboration. It's the one with the two hands. And the other notice um, just recognizes that they know that attribution is incomplete. So it's a recognition that there's... Um, the ability to work together to improve the quality of data that's available. And so I'm going to pass on to Libby to talk a little bit about how um, 
she's thought about this being used in the context of her research work. Thanks, Molly. So I'm going to introduce the Genomics Observatory's Metadata Database, which is a database designed to hold metadata relevant to biological collections and any associated genetic data. So it's designed to complement existing repositories for genetic data, genetic sequences, such as NCBI or the Sequence Read Archive, for instance. So John Deck, who's on the call today, is the lead developer of Geome, and several of the steering committee are also part of the panel today. So if you've got questions, ask them. Um, but Geome naturally lends itself to holding the metadata that we're talking about relevant to the indigenous context of the biological samples. So um, we think that Geome can be thought of as um, an institution and so can display that cultural institution notice that Maui just introduced. And I don't know if you can see on your screen, it looks like it's cut off on mine, but if you are to navigate to the Geome website, there is the um, cultural institution notice just at the bottom of the, of the website, which means that um, they're open and welcome, welcoming, I guess, to um, interact with Indigenous communities and researchers who want to work with Indigenous communities around the application of these notices and labels. So um, to fully understand the functionality of Geome, um, I'll just point you to uh, the reference that was on the previous slide. That's our latest description. Um, it's in Molecular Ecology Resources, and it really talks about um, case studies where Geome can be used to capture metadata relevant to lots of different kinds of genetic research, whole genome sequencing, metagenomics, population genetics, and for individual researchers, as well as large multinational uh, research institutions or consortia. Cool. So um, I got involved with Geome, I guess, through um, my own interests within New Zealand. So here in New Zealand, I lead the Ira Moana project, which is a team that operates within Geome's infrastructure. So uses the infrastructure of Geome. Now, if you want to go to the next slide. So the um, impetus of the Ira Moana project was to improve research practice um, for New Zealand's molecular colleges. So encouraging them to retain important spatial and temporal metadata alongside biological collections, and that's relevant to genetic data, um, but also to consider and include that important indigenous provenance of samples um, so that the relationships that are established at the time of collection events or at the time of um, the conception of research projects, which is often with those local communities, often indigenous communities, we want to be able to retain that information throughout the data life cycle um, as metadata so that when the data is at the end of the project is deposited into genetic data repositories and the metadata ends up in places like Geome, that there is still that persisting connection back to the local community. Um, so really closing that loop in what we call the data life cycle. It's also important for onlookers, so secondary use of those genetic data that they understand that there was some context to the collection of that data in the first instance was done in consultation potentially with an Indigenous community and some of those considerations, rights and responsibilities to the data need to be recognised and addressed um, before there can be any reuse of the data. So that's what the Iramwana project was trying to do um, and what we came to realise is that um, these labels, these notices and labels that I've been introduced to through Maui and Jane really are um, the right or a potential way to capture those sorts of pieces of metadata um, within a framework that already exists. So if you go to the next slide, Maui, I can just demonstrate that this is um, a view of Geome. So Geome already holds a wealth of metadata alongside any sample. And uh, like I said before, John can speak to the use and development of the fields that primarily derive from Darwin Core and the Genomic Standards Consortium, as I understand it. So those are the sorts of standardized fields that Geome presently offers. And while they do a great job in my own context, my own studies, what I found is that they don't quite represent those indigenous connections that I really wanted to point to within my data set. So for instance, here, um, I found myself referring to the indigenous tribes I work with, Natikuri and Taukuri. Um, really the best field I could find to represent those relationships was landowner which I think to anyone, it seems obvious that that's not quite the right place, but it was the only place I could, I could shoehorn it. Um, likewise, although there was some kind of consenting process that I went through with those iwi and hapu, um, I didn't feel like it was an appropriate place to put that within the permit information, for instance, um, because it wasn't a permit as such. It was more of an agreement, a relationship. Um, so really I struggled to find the right places to put 
put these um, kinds of information. So if we look at the next slide, um, so around this, um, John, Maui, and myself, we sort of, um, and Jane, sorry, thought about how we could potentially work in these notices and labels into a framework which already exists within GEO. And our first goal at this was using the trad traditional knowledge notice. So you can see here, it's basically a new field, which um, in this first instance has a true false um, that can be entered uh, by a researcher. And that would indicate um, that there are accompanying cultural rights and responsibilities around that sample um, and around that data. And this is really a precursor to what we'd like to do in extending the metadata fields to include other kinds of notices and labels and really what we'd like your feedback on today about what kinds of fields might be appropriate, what kind of language and where they might naturally fit. So we'll go to the next slide, I think my final slide. I guess ultimately what we want to do um, is that we want these indigenous contexts and permissions to be visible to the research community using GEO. So other people like me who are doing this kind of genetic research or wanting to use genetic data. And we'd like to enable researchers to use uh, metadatabases like GEO to be able to search using certain labels or notice definitions. So for instance, um, only searching for data that is maybe consent verified, which is one of our labels, or maybe um, data that's uh, labeled as being suitable for research use. Um, so this is the grand goal and we're a few steps along the way and looking forward to your input on um, other ways to do these things. Okay, thanks Libby. Um, so yeah, this is John Deck speaking and uh, I think I was, we met in New Zealand last year um, to try and come up with a system, you know, we we're talking about biocultural labels and, and the idea is we wanted to develop some way where we could um, suit this for the biodiversity domain. And we recognized that what was developed for traditional knowledge labels worked well for cultural institutions, but um, didn't quite fit for biodiversity. Um, so we wanted to come up with something um, in particular that could adapt itself to material samples and, and things that were collected across the globe in different environments. Um, so what we wanted to do is, is start with, I mean, what's most important is, is the tribes and, and, and the people that are indigenous to particular areas. Um, so we developed you know, a system kind of around the tribes and a way for them to register with, uh, with an application um, and that they could in particular um, customize some of these labels that we talked about um, that Maui presented earlier. You can go to the next slide. Um, so here we have a, kind of a, a, a system where we could like follow the flow of what might happen in practice with an application. We have a tribe in the upper right hand corner. We have researchers in the upper left hand corner. And we have a situation where researchers are, are going to many different places across the globe. And, and oftentimes um, without much knowledge about the indigenous peoples who are there, um, or maybe they do have knowledge and maybe they're using um, the expertise of certain indigenous peoples. Um, and they want to basically do a, do a good job and, and accurately track their data, um, which, is a, which is a huge challenge if a researcher is uh, going to different places across the globe, you know, collecting things. Um, how do they do this? Um, so we developed a system where they could either interact directly with an application such as Geome, and I'm calling Geome as a, a proxy application. Um, and by proxy, meaning that the researcher might want to just interact with Geome and Geome could then talk to the biocultural label hub or the researcher could talk directly to the hub itself. So you see kind of arrows pointing from the researcher to Geome or researcher to the DC hub. And Geome could just be one of any several possible ways that you can get at the hub. But you'll see in the, in the left-hand corner, the project metadata. So in GEOM, we call the, the projects that we're talking about here in GEOM are called expeditions. 
And what these are is just, uh, it's like it's an intended sampling effort in a particular area where we're gonna define the who, when, where, and what um, target species as well that the researcher is gonna be going after. Um, Geome assigns um, ARC identifiers for these expeditions and all of the samples that are contained with this expedition. Um, and they basically request from the hub um, a, a, actually we should go to the next slide because actually it explains it a little better if you just go ahead. Um, what I'm talking about here is this hub request where they send in this identifier that describes the project metadata their ORCID and, and a label. Um, and that goes to the hub. And then inside the hub, there's a spot for the tribe to interact with the hub itself. And they're noted, the tribe is notified, hey, a particular researcher wants to do something in your area. Um, and there's an administrator which can help broker these requests. It might initiate a discussion as well in the upper part here, the tribe to the researcher, and maybe they would say, what are you interested in doing? And then the researcher could talk to the tribe. Then they would go back, the tribe would verify this request for a particular label. And that verification would sit inside the hub. So the response mechanism from the hub would be something like if you're familiar with GitHub um, and offering of shields. Um, so basically it's a label that is provided on demand. Um, so we know that it's been approved by the tribe and, and so applications such as Geom could then display this label approval that would come directly from the hub that's been authorized by the tribe. If it's clicked on, the label to text would show you what the tribe wrote and the, the particular approval that was given for this particular specimen. And we also want to note that the approval, we're working out now exactly how to do this, but the approval could come from an expedition. So it could apply to sets of specimen that you might encounter in a collecting trip in, a, in, a, in the locale that you're in. I put NCBI in bold in here as well, um, just because not, not that they're signed up right now, but this is something that we envisioned down the road that we'd have multiple applications could be participating um, with, with the hub and, and this design. Um, that's all I have to say about this, the BC hub application. So we can move on. So um, as we've been developing uh, this particular, uh, the delivery of the biocultural labels and the traditional knowledge labels and the notices, uh, we are in the process of creating the local context hub for that delivery. This is just an image of the UX design for that. At the moment on um, one side you have what it would look like from a community standpoint as they're developing uh, their labels. Uh, we already have that as part of local context for the TK labels. This is an adaption of that and an, an enhancement of that. Um, but also what you can see is what this might look like for an institution as well, where it's clear uh, how many notices have been uh, added, where they've been added, the different kinds of training that's available, and also the relationships that are developing between the communities and the institution. So making that visible and creating the capacity for that transparency in this process of doing this work uh, is really key to what the Local Context Hub is able to do, not only to deliver the labels to institutions and for researchers to develop their notices, but also to be able to track and understand the relationships that are being created. If anything, the labels and the notices are about creating equitable relationships around data into the future. So one of the other partners that we have as we're moving forward with all this work is ORCID. Um, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with ORCID. We, we are uh, in conversation about what that would mean for ORCID to be able to use the notices and to actually be able to have that tracked as part of any researcher's uh, uh, site. 
what's important here is to think about there are multiple parties uh, we're working for and with. Uh, we're working with communities, we're working with institutions, and we're working with researchers. And without kind of considering all of those different needs, and they all do have needs and they are all different, um, we can't create a system that can deliver this. So ORCID is very key for us in relationship to thinking through how a researcher is able to kind of make transparent these relationships that are um, part of the research, but it, there is no place, as Libby was talking about before, there is no place to make them visible. Um, and so this is kind of really why the work with ORCID is so important. And that then, of course, leads us into publishing. Uh, the, we're working with the Nature Publishing Group in relationship to thinking about how the labels and the notices could be utilised within public, the publishing context. Um, this is a very uh, um, important and alive discussion that Nature is very keen to be having just because it starts to pass out what does ethics in research start to look like, how, to diff how do you um, incentivize uh, better research practices or practices that are actually more attuned to historical failures in research and the problems that we're dealing with, which is largely what the TK labels have had to be developed to deal with. Um, and how, what, how and what might that mean for the future, not only in relationship to researcher community practices, institution community uh, relationships but also moving forward into how the various publics that get access to this information can make meaning when they know where this information has come from from this first place um, yeah so the final part of this that we want to do before I'm kind of moving into some of the questions and it's great because we have, it looks like we'll have um, a good amount of time for the other panelists to add uh, their concerns and questions and thoughts into this. But we've also uh, created a recommended practice for provenance of Indigenous people's data through the IEEE as part of this work, understanding that provenance is a key area that uh, for Indigenous uh, people and for information around where Indigenous data comes from is lacking. This work allows us to start thinking about what that could be and creating the parameters for uh, digitally embedding provenance. Um, it's obviously one of our biocultural labels, but also thinking about what that could mean for a whole range of different areas, including machine learning and AI contexts as well. So it, 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 the problems are very similar across these spaces, um, but their articulation and what needs to be developed requires the certain kind of attention to specificity which is what we're really wanting to bring this to um, Tadwig for this conference uh, today. Maui? Uh, kia ora. Yeah, and so, um, and so one of the things we've been thinking of in, in, this, in this sort of context as people have become interested in the application of the TK labels in different domains and, you know, and the interest that's emerging around the biocultural labels as well is do they sit within a field that is just about the labels or do they get um, kind of passed out into different places and we've been thinking about what actually the function of different labels is and some of them function in a, a space that is directly related to provenance but then there's other ones that are kind of talking a little bit more about what the approved purpose is or what the sort of permissions that the community is giving to next users looks like um, and then there's other ones that relate a little bit more to protocols and what I mean is sort of like the, the cultural protocols that surround the use of that information. So whether it should only be used by men, whether it should only be used by women, the seasonal label, I think which Jane described, where it's, you know, used at a certain time of the year. And so those each, you know, these labels are doing different things. And does that mean that they should sit in different fields? Um, you know, these are kind of some of the, the questions that we're um, sort of bouncing around as we're starting to think, you know, how do these, how, how would these relate to um, standards in the standards community? And similarly with the biocultural labels, um, ones here that think that are talking about provenance, either the, the provenance label, but also multiple communities. And then the other ones are, are more about those, that same kind of purpose or permissioning element. Um, but we don't have protocol ones at the moment 
but they may arise as we start using them with communities and they want to define how um, how future use of what future use of that data might look like and that's where those ones might start um, emerging into the future and it's been the basis of some really um, fascinating conversations we've been having with our uh, panelists here um, who uh, you know Libby and Libby and John have um, spoken a bit but we've really got some some questions for them to uh, and engage with or, or or make a comment on before we open it up more more broadly yeah. so neil um, neil's, not, neil's not here at the moment but maybe we start with chris sure thanks guys i think that's a, a great introduction i appreciate it i mean i'm and i have to say you know if, if you're i'm still kind of new to this as well but i'm very concerned about as a, a museum scientist you know i think that this is a really important challenge for us to start thinking about what best practices are for responsible science moving forward. You know, it's, and it's all about, you know, how do we implement these practical and ethical yet functional solutions, you know, to data management and towards our goals for fair data use and, and uh, use and reuse. So, um, you know, again, as a curator and somebody who's in charge of collections, um, you know, what would, what would, you know, this look like in the, the, the implementation of this look like uh, in the context of a natural history museum where, where we're responsible for you know managing collections and their associated data i think it's does it require a, a complete change in our di digital infrastructure can we leverage other existing systems in a certain way um, and i think you know from all the work that most anybody who's done with data management understands it's providing these linkages really early on in the uh in the data management chain and the life cycle of information is really, really critical. And so while this might not be the perfect solution or the, the final implementation of this, we can start now is, is my point. And, and this, is, this is where we start these discussions and figure out where it fits and how we can start implementing this in a responsible and ethical way. So that's my, my big thought process in this. And to the standards community, I mean, we have to have standards to deal with these data to make them uh useful and so um that's why i'm really interested in thinking about how do we do this uh in in a responsible implementable and practical way and uh, there's some questions in the chat about you know lowering the bars to thresholds and what that would look like but i think we can do it um it may not be perfect now but we can certainly start so that's my thoughts there yeah thanks chris i think that this kind of question i mean we're all we're all kind of new to it in the sense that there hasn't been anything like this before um, and so this kind of question about what does it look like and how do we um, move it forward and also how does it address like historical um, historical erasures within data management uh, itself we're left with these collections but they don't have this information or they haven't that it wasn't seen to be important in the first place so how do we kind of go back and correct but hold, also how do we transform into the future and I think that's that key question around equity and responsibility that we have as researchers as allied scholars and as working with indigenous communities. Katie, I wonder if you could jump in now and kind of think about the, the questions that you're interested in as well in this in this context. Yeah, you know, I was thinking so following on what Chris said, um, you know, he's talking about from the perspective of a museum curator, I'm thinking from the GGBM perspective, it's like one step forward. It's like the GGBM community, it's an organization of biorepositories that manage genetic collections. And we have a set of standards, which are TABIG standards, um, that are Darwin Core extensions that align with GSC. And we want to make sure that everybody who manages genetic collections are using standard best practices. And we've created a series of permit fields um, that we want everyone to implement. So that's great. And we're trying to figure out how to best align across INSDC databases, um, how to make sure that those permit fields and that permit information is uh, being made discoverable and linked to publications and linked back to the voucher information within natural history collections. So then I step back and say, okay, what you guys are doing is really cool and it's really important. So then how do we make sure this information 
is also included in these natural history collections. And I feel like it's almost a whole separate set of standards or maybe it's linked to the current set of standards. And I think that's just a, something that we need to kind of brainstorm and figure out as a group, how they best fit within the global community of people managing genetic collections and caring about genetic collections and caring about where they came from um, and how they're being used. Um, Great. Thank you, Katie. And I think that that gives us a lot of, I mean, this is what we want to have a conversation with everybody about. We don't have all the answers uh, here. We're kind of presenting a, you know, a particular kind of initiative that uh, produces its own kinds of questions. And there is a real need for kind of multiple thinking in multiple directions to kind of help make this work in, um, in the various contexts that we're we're dealing with. Libby, you spoke a little bit already to the different kinds of needs of researchers, but I wonder if you could speak to um, how the labels and the notices can support different or transformative research practices. Yeah, so I guess um, I sort of rephrased my question a bit from what was there and I put it in the general discussion. Um, I'm really interested in how we can encourage uptake in the research community. So researchers like myself who are mostly interested in biodiversity type questions, for instance, but of course we're always working in indigenous contexts or most of the time. Um, and I hear what Katie was saying, you, you know, what we're talking about here is um, sort of potentially a separate set of standards, but um, I worry that if it becomes sort of a separate entity, separate from Darwin Core and what the community is already using or starting to use, it um, runs the risk of being omitted from what has been um, accepted practice. So I'm interested in um, understanding from this community how um, we can lower the bar for researchers so that they can start to use the labels and notices. And I, and I think the notices were really born out of, you know, um, a want for, for like an, an entry for researchers into the discussion where actually the Indigenous communities are the ones who have to provide the labels and it has to be that way. But the notices give um, the opportunity for a researcher to be proactive and start that discussion or show some support for this initiative. Um, and I just wonder whether there are other ways in which this broader community who thinks about standards and uptake um, have any wisdom or advice around how to best do that. You know, what could be the carrot for the researchers? How can we encourage best practice like what Chris was saying? Um, and are there infrastructures or ways around um, how we implement this that would influence those. So there are quite a few questions coming up in the um, general discussion that I don't know, um, some of them lead on from what I've been saying. There's some coming up to the chat as well. Jane or Maui, is there a way you would like to step through those or? Well, why don't I just um, just begin by addressing this question around culturally sensitive data or words um, and, and kind of what that can do within the um, the suite of the TK labels. We do ha we have two particular labels that try and address this. One is the um, secret sacred label, which is being used by communities to actually um, cover photographs of ancestors or um, data from ancestors that uh, communities feel shouldn't be displayed or should not have been collected. So there's a certain kind of sensitivity around that material, which I'm sure many people are already familiar with. But the culturally sensitive label was really developed as a means for um, an alert to be care and to have care and to be careful about uh, particular kinds of collections, particularly collections that have derogatory names that are used on um, on records. Uh, the way, particularly, uh, for instance, um, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs documents, uh, census records historically that have derogatory language around them. So the culturally sensitive label does a lot of work to kind of alert people to um, you know, just just historical uh, failures to properly think about who this material is going to be used by in the future. And I think that that connects into a, a certain kind of question around thinking about what sensitivities need to be thought through and how they need to be thought through. Again, we're dealing with spaces that haven't um, 
I haven't, it's not that we haven't thought about it, we just don't, haven't got the tools yet for thinking about that in a different kind of way or making it visible. And in many ways, communities don't want some of that material hidden uh, because it erases that past, right? It erases the idea that, that, that those historical trajectories that lead to where we are now. But they do want care around how that's used and they do want kind of responsibility and uh, a different kind of concern for uh, adequately taking that responsibility. Uh, and so in many ways that's why we developed the culturally sensitive label to start addressing some of those particular problems. Mal, you're muted. No, I was, I was just looking to see where the where the next question was. So there was there was a question here from Tommy about um, are these labels meant to be database or exhibit only? Or should they put on associated with specimens? And the comment that in some places some specimens have a limited number of uh, limited space where labels can be applied, and just think about how they get um, kind of attached. Any thoughts? So I, I wrote a little response there, just that um, I think as far as we've thought about the labels, we've thought about them as being metadata held in a database. Um, so the important thing would be, I guess, that that specimen has some persistent and unique identifier within the museum or collection system that then has some kind of digital database alongside it. Um, and I guess we'd assumed that to be the case, but maybe it's not the case for all collections. Um, so maybe it is something that we need to navigate. I mean, Maui, at some stage, there was talk of making labels almost well, machine readable and uniquely identifiable, right? In each use case, but whether that's a road or rabbit warren we want to go down right now, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, well, I think, you know, it's, it's one of those things that's just trying to think about what the, uh, how they become useful into the future. And given that we're trying to make, um, trying to connect people, we're trying to, in the first instance, connect the, the samples back to the places where they came from and demonstrate those community protocols. But actually, once that generates its own kind of, essentially database and set of information, in what ways might you like to search for for things within that. And so I think that becomes uh, a point where having unique identifiers becomes useful because it lends itself towards uh, towards that in the future, whether it's connecting with communities or connecting communities with a variety of different institutions or people that are, you know, all the groups that are open to commercialization around a particular um, kind of a particular species. So the I think it's still um, definitely, uh, definitely on the horizon. Uh, the only other component that sort of uh, connects to this, and it's it's not really around attaching it to something like an insect, but um, certainly there's some discussions with uh, some of the museums about how they can represent um, on or around the specimens they have, the physical specimens which people can go and look at, what kinds of protocols or what sorts of discussions have been had with those traditional owners. And so it becomes clear to people that are looking at them that those sorts of things have taken place and uh, use of a form of label in that kind of way. I mean, and I'll, I'll just add to that because I'm just um, picking up the, that chat from Tommy there um, in relationship to that. It is really interesting, Tommy. I mean, we developed these as a particular kind of digital intervention just in the first instance because we were dealing with so many problems that were coming out of the digitization of collections that meant that many of the um, many of the problems or the erasures or the kind of missing information were just repeated as that kind of next digital metadata was created. Um, but what we're finding at the moment is the movement back to the tangible, back to the collections themselves, back to a certain kind of way in which um, those collections need to have notifications on them to help collect, to help collections management managers in the reels, like when you're at the collections and what does that look like and so this this interesting way in which the the digital then tracks back to the tangible 
and back to the tangible specimens themselves or the tangible objects that are in the institutional collections, as you say, starts to make visible that entire chain in a different kind of way. And I think what that's really interesting for me. I mean, we're starting to do work on um, collections care notices that would really be for collections managers in the in the, um, the 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 bulk of the collections within institutions that's not necessarily a digital label but there's a way in which that digital label can also manifest itself tangibly and so we kind of those movements between are really interesting if you think about creative commons creative commons developed as a um, as a digital intervention uh, and it then moved to being actually being able to be put on books so we're thinking about that as well as what what the labels can do and how we kind of move them backwards and forwards because it's necessary. I mean, that's that's the problem. It's necessary at all at all levels. So there's a question here about um, the buy in buy in from indigenous communities. Um, I'm not sure if any of the rest of the panel have had a chance to talk with uh, any of the people they collaborate with around around these? Libby, you're nodding your head. Yeah, I could just say that um, it sort of speaks to a couple of questions actually. So uh, I work very closely with the Auckland Museum and there's a large natural history collection there. And a lot of that comes from historic uh, research expeditions to Rangitahua, the Kimberley Highlands. Uh, Ngati Kuri has governance over that seascape landscape. Um, and the Auckland Museum has a really close working relationship with Ngāti Kuri and um, around that there is a very detailed, I guess, um, protocol for the way in which they work together and collaborate. But that kind of collaboration and, um, I guess, shared governance of collections isn't quite captured in the collections that has, are historic. So we're going through the process um, and Maui is helping out with this um, and Jane to uh, retrospectively apply labels to existing collections within the natural history collection. And that's been done with Ngāti Kuri. So um, for that, we anticipate that uh, there will be certain labels that would pertain to the whole museum's natural history collection from that location. But in some instances, there will be um, some species that are treated more than others or of some kind of significance in which case there would be um, some separate labels or additional labels applied. Um, so that answers one of the questions uh, where, I mean, we're not entirely sure, I don't think how it's gonna play out in every use case, but some of the use cases we're exploring are, are these ones where there is a, a larger collection of multiple species and maybe multiple time periods where the same labels can be applied, but there'll be other cases where it's really one individual specimen of a given species and it's, you know, one relevant, um, collection event where there are unique labels. So um, we sort of have a feeling through the interaction between the hub and Geome how that can potentially work, but seeing how it's actually gonna play out is, is, another, um, is another story. And Maui, I know you've been working with other, other tribes around New Zealand as well. Yeah, so we've had um, we've had a range of conversations. I wouldn't say that there's sort of a, a uniform, a uniform buy-in. And, and part of that is um, around, it sort of, it sits on a spectrum. So I saw that someone uh, mentioned OCAP before as well and um, how that's applied within Canada. And so in lots of ways, that's, you know, a very strong, or points towards a much kind of stronger expression of sort of data sovereignty by saying, you know, we have ownership and control and control access and possession and all control access partly through possession. And so that works when you're in a situation where you do have all of those things. But in most settings, we're working with institutions that are the ones that possess it. They're the ones that are kind of determining where access goes. And so ownership is and ownership is off the table as well. So um, I think the, the labels work well as, as, as we're seeing them in, in my community and also with the other communities that... Um, that are wanting to adopt them as informing the way they can work together with institutions to determine what appropriate access and use looks like. And um, I think that will, uh, that meets, that meets a variety of different needs. And sometimes those are needs of the institution. Um, 
in terms of being able to say, uh, demonstrate um, ethical practice, but meet, um, support the researchers that are making use of that data, meet um, kind of expectations into the future, whether it's around Nagoya, uh, sort of the Nagoya protocol. Um, and also for communities that they're able to, that they feel like the only way of having any kind of control over the data is by removing it from an open space. And so you can automatically remove, well, not remove, but you can have a different sort of nuance to your conversation with them that isn't just about kind of shutting away that information. And it can now still be out there. People can use it, but you know that there's a way that they can um, connect back to you because it's very, your, your name, your association with that information is very present in the places where it ends up. I would just add um, before, I think moving to, there's a question there from Bob that I think that um, it would be great to address, but um, the TK labels were developed, they've been around for 10 years because we were working with indigenous communities to develop them. Um, if this project didn't work for indigenous communities, there would be no point to it, honestly. Um, and so that kind of work that required very um, particular um, uh, partnerships, very particular attention to decolonial methodologies, very particular attention to anti-colonial theory and what that means as a kind of how you even develop a project like this has been what we've been working on for 10 years that allows us to bring it to you kind of now. Um, but there isn't going to be uniform agreement because there isn't uniform agreement across every Indigenous community anyway and to kind of expect that would already be um, problematic. I think what we do know is that for communities that this that that are want to, that want to use these tools, there are no other tools. There aren't any tools. This isn't going to be the only tool either. There needs to be new tools developed. This is just a start and kind of a way to move some of these questions forward um, with without relying on uh, potentially an international treaty that may or may not be developed after 20 years being negotiated within international contexts with no way of kind of um, making kind of uh, incursions into the infrastructures that maintain certain kinds of colonial logics. So we're doing a lot to try and get it to a different place, but the 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 centrality of Indigenous partnerships in making this work has been core to the project from the, its very inception. Um, and I think that is is, is really important um, about why and how we kind of bring that to you now. So this question that Bob is asking around um, assumptions of certainty or certain kinds of data uncertainty is, is really important. And, uh, you know, that data uncertainty exists in multiple contexts, not just, uh, you know, it does exist in a New Zealand context as well. Um, and I think we, we can't necessarily solve all those problems around data uncertainty. And, and maybe this is kind of where I'm going to throw it to Chris for a moment in thinking about um, different ways in which if you can are able to capture some of this information from the beginning, you can help make different decisions about how that data gets used into the future. And I think that's kind of really a significant intervention that we're trying to make here, where we're trying to shift certain kinds of uncertainties into certainties, but in no means trying to solve all the uncertainties, because that's actually an impossible task as well. Were you going to throw that one at me, Jane? I was, I was, I was. <laughs> Actually, I was going to let Bob speak if he wanted to say something about that. I'd, I'd really like to hear your thoughts because I think capturing the uncertainty is in a standards community. That's that's pretty challenging. <laughs> so, sure, and I, I don't think it's necessarily a matter of solving the uncertainty. Uh, it's a matter of flagging it, and uh, a tagging system needs to do that. That's the only point I was making. Yeah, and I think that one of the things that I was interested in what you were saying there, Bob. Uh, multiple the the multiple communities label right the multiple communities label is a good label that recognizes that kind of multiple interests they might not necessarily be clear but there are species don't necessarily tend to only be in one community context in the first place and so that is already can create different kinds of challenges Maui do you want to speak a little bit to that because I think you you have some good examples around that kind of how the multiple communities label can 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 help identify the uncertainty rather than solving the uncertainty. 
ho hopefully it will come to me what that good example you're talking about is. But um, I think, you know, there's the situation, that situation exists at the moment um, where, you know, there's uh, those multiple interests and things are already in place, but, you know, a researcher chooses to work with one community. And it might be just because, you know, that's who they've got a relationship with. Those were the ones that replied to the email. You know, there's a whole range of reasons how that comes about. Um, and, you know, if it, if it is heading down a, a, a sort of an ex example where people do want to um, do something commercial out of it, then that's the group which ends up being at the front of the queue in the conversation. So there's a whole lot of other challenges, I guess, that, that emerge um, from, from doing that. But I think in terms of being able to for the indigenous communities themselves to be able to recognize it through the multiple community label, then we get the opportunity to kind of deal with those relationships ourselves, if that makes sense. Um, because we have these relationships with these other places that exist at, at and um, exist outside of a sort of the, the science research space. And we need to, you know, keep those things going. So we're doing that. We're doing that at the moment. Um, as we start thinking about uh, a project that's looking at the genome of a muscle. And we want to demonstrate that ours is different from others, but we know it's actually going to be connected to at least all the ones along the coast where we're at. So, and how we have um, discussions with them about not only the research project, but other opportunities for um, developing relationships and things into the future. Uh, that sits there. That sits there as well. I mean, I see Neil. I see Neil's um, just joined us as well. And uh, I think you know some of these, some of these, this sort of question probably plays out in the context of what he's been doing around the Fair Island. I'm not sure if he's had enough time to catch up on the basis <laughs> of the conversation. But Bob, Bob had asked this um, interesting question, which is sitting in the. Uh, sitting in the in the chat there around assumptions of certainty and just how do we deal with um, uncertainty between the rights of diff the rights of different interest groups around uh, or across across a region yeah uh, sorry for being late <laughs> I'm not quite sure what the question is but uh, um, I might repeat it but uh, yeah I know the our island project, would, I mean, certainly with the biocultural labels in identifying, you know, from the data management plans, identifying what stakeholders communities might have rights or interests in those uh, in those samples and data. It's something we want to work up in the best practices and data policies and connectivity. But I probably should listen in a little bit more <laughs> and answer a question or I repeat something. Well, well, maybe, um, Neil, we could ask you to speak a little bit to the question that you had um, posed uh, a little earlier and that I think that I had wanted you to speak to, which is thinking about what provenance fields don't exist and how the labels uh, start to think, start to allow different kind of thinking around um, cultural and ethical standards that uh, might need to be with data. And I think that that would be a really another really important piece to add into this conversation yeah I, mean, I think the the one of the strengths which i'm sure you've mentioned of, of the traditional knowledge labels and, and biocultural labels is to start to flag where the 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 social and cultural con contextual metadata or data that are associated with these are, are really important scientifically as well so to identify what we're missing this, it's part of the context of those samples and it has real scientific utility. Uh, so now those cultural and social and legal contexts, where, what are the metadata standards? What are the standards? What are the fields that are relevant there? Um, are they well worked out by other standards organizations? If so, can we just import them and you know, they can be added in or into a, into the biodiversity standard in some way or map, mapped across. And then can we identify minimum ones, for example, that might be 
really significant for the kinds of samples that we're talking about and the kinds of uses that those samples and data are put to. So it, it does open up that uh, really important thing that I think we might not have addressed as fully as we could have done is that these the context isn't just the physical environmental context or even the biological context, it's the social, uh, legal, and, and uh, um, ethical context of those. And then a, a related area of which is, is slightly different, but would be the administrative <laughs> context, which is all the, the metadata around, you know, why are you doing it? And, and some of that's needed for reporting, but that, that is another form of social context mm -hmm. too. I think that's that's um, so important. I mean, one of the the ways in which we understand the labels to some extent is thinking about how they can um, be used as within this um, uh, you know acronym of ELSI or of kind of like ethical legal. Uh, uh kind of questions that arise around data and what does that look like and how do we actually ha develop tools or practices that can incorporate those questions uh moving forward within kind of fields and within standards but also within practice and so i think that how, how what that looks like or how we craft ways of doing that um become pretty important questions moving forward which you know taps into what Chris was saying before about what do we want responsible research to look like in 20 years? How would we know? How would we know? And wh how, how do we create mechanisms that help us know um, the different kinds of processes or the different kinds of relationships that have been developed to that underpin that research in, in the first instance? And then that connects to, I think, some of the questions that Libby um, was, was raising as well. Uh, so that was one thing maybe about the Fair Island concept too, and the, the importance of data management plans as, a, as an entry point into all this. Partly it points you to what kinds of standards should, you should be using depending on what kind of research you're doing. But also this the link into, uh, uh, okay, you're going to be doing this. And so the, the more machine actionable ones or that are sort of AI enhanced, if you like, Say, oh, if you're doing this, you know, you should think about these these kinds of labels or these issues. So it points helps kind of a, a wizard type of a support for that, but also connects, you know, to well, who who might be interested in this? You know, now if you're interested in a particular region, it could be an indigenous community or, or others who are tracking that space and say, if anything's happening in this space, I want to be notified. You know, so it, it to to try and make that whole process easier to comply with because it, it can be very difficult um, both for uh, stakeholders to be constantly monitoring what scientists are doing but also for scientists to you know try and keep up with who do I have to inform you know I, I don't know and do they do they care or do they have time to talk to me because I, I want to get approval or, or mission or I want to do it right but you know they don't have time to listen to me and I don't know how to find people so so ways to make that uh, and that's a discovery sort of process, which is you need metadata and you need this embedded in it so you can actually speed that all up and, and have auto, more automated compliance without overwhelming everyone, without having to check whatever everyone else is doing, which no one really wants to have to do. So around that, um, I'm going to prompt Maui to speak maybe because so there is one label which, um, you know, for biodiversity researchers who are not looking to commercialize the genetic data for, you know, repurpose the genetic data for any commercial gain, um, there is a label which is research use, am I correct, Maui, that, you know, gives the okay basically for certain kinds of research. And I think that we're yet to fully understand what that would encompass. Um, but, you know, potentially that would be a label that would enable there to be a go ahead with certain kinds of research without that heavy burden of consultation necessarily. And then the, the commercial label is not, it's okay to commercialize, it's more we're open to a dialogue or having a conversation around the commercialization of this information or um, of this specimen. 
now you probably understand better the origins of those. Maybe Jane. <laughs> well, sure. So um, yeah, and, and part of it is about sort of the challenges we know exist and um, getting involved, getting involved in a research project. And so that might be for a conservation purpose, but the community is asking questions about um, the intellectual property and you know these things that are gonna these things that might happen with it down a commercialization track that aren't known at that point in time. And it's um, we're trying to do with the labels is allow the right people to be involved in the discussion at the time they need to be. And so when that happens, when that happens later on in the piece, and that might be 10 users down the track or 100 users down the track before you know something emerges in that in that instance, it's really hard to actually engage in a, um, a to cold call a tribe and say, <laughs> do you want to do you want to get involved in this? And but you know if if they have been in in some ways acclimatized to the possibility because they've been using the labels and because you know if I'm thinking from my point of view we would have had the internal conversation that actually we're open to that conversation we know it's going to come at um, a time which is way down the end of a track rather than at the beginning and it might be from a left field point of view then it's it enables that possibility there will have to be a whole range of other um, other things that get put in place, which are the agreements. And I think this is also where it kind of connects to um, one of the other questions about um, uh, how much you can control or, or, or hide data as well. I think there's, it's, it doesn't do all of those things, but it supports a conversation that might be had about whether data needs to be controlled or not. Um, it supports a conversation about whether commercialization is possible or not, but it doesn't actually have to determine it. So it allows you to kind of move into that and then have those um, have those things be dealt with at the time when they're relevant. If that make I don't know if that makes sense, but often that's that's the hard bit for a community is to try and second guess what might happen rather than make a decision about what's right in front of you, because as soon as things are open, it enables all these other options up. But they're not options being considered by the person you're working with. Yeah, I mean, it opens up the possibility for collaboration, of course, which is, is the, is the, it's open, open data, but how, how do you enable collaboration, which requires the right terms of you know, any collaboration there are uh, you're creating a commons essentially between the collaborators right and then you agree on how you're going to manage the what you create down the line which in this case might be data um for other products but but as you add new as, as it moves along the value chain you're adding new uh, collaborators along the way when you, you know, extract some dna and now someone in the lab is doing something they become a collaborator too and so they all have uh, this is maybe what we mean by fluid commons, <laughs> but they all have uh, <laughs> they all have a a uh, it's dynamic. The, the 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 commons stakeholders grows. You know, and each time you add someone in, they add something to the commons, but they also have some some rights or some you know, like a stake in it, and they become yeah. a steward. Um, so how do you keep updating that as you as you roll, as it rolls along? Yeah, and 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 adding adding in without dropping off. I think that's where a lot of indigenous communities feel like right. happens is other people get added in and they get <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there's a metaphor for that isn't there what is that when, when the people at the beginning drop off and then new people get on they can only have so many people on the on the right at once <laughs> yeah that's interesting no, that's exactly right that's it and the people at the origin are the ones who leave you know first in first off right? that's the, <laughs> <laughs> and the one left hold, left holding it at the end that gets all the glory. And I think the hard thing, and, and I mean another sort of you know kind of challenging thing for probably uh, people from the the global south. I'm not sure if New Zealand gets included in the global south or not, but um, 
is uh, the the ability, like where the, the technical capacity is to actually generate a lot of value off um, off data and off kind of big data sits with big institutions, multinational corporations, the places where you've got that kind of concentration of power and resource and capacity. And that doesn't, kind of doesn't find its way back to, you know, my small community on the east coast of the North Island. So um, the labels insert us into the system in a way where we can be more present or at least try and um, continue to be present as, as that value is generated along, um, along the train, whether that value is just a sort of an academic knowledge creation value or whether that value shifts into some other sort of um, kind of monetary value. Chris? So Maui, can I, let me ask a question pertaining to this concept of an early commons, right? So basically the labels would allow you to basically start building that commons from the incipient point of the material sample or the, the object or whatever. And that's really would inherit all the concepts that you call provenance, right? So in your first tier, no matter what happens, provenance isn't going to change. But there could be multiple subsets of purpose that fall under that that would fall to a different tiering of, of um, intent. Is that would that be fair to say? So that not you would provenance would get inherited throughout the chain, but purpose might be for different forks that would happen in the in a data cycle. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you'd have to the system would have to be able to track those those derivative events or the derivative chains, right? And we and, and we kind of expect that those things might change over time as people um, get different experiences, become more, um, develop different capabilities and capacities or become more comfortable with research and kind of commercialization. So as that happens, um, the idea is that they would be in a position to be able to change the settings around around what those kind of purpose elements might look like and maybe even um, evolve the protocols over time or or decide how um, I guess other components fit in with it so when you know Neil talked about the data management plans where they sit um, where does you know, kind of governance around the data sit what sorts of you know is it possible to layer on um, sort of some kind of smart contract or blockchain type um, component to the open to commercialization label. So mm -hmm. the degree to which the system can facilitate the communication without it being too um, active. I noticed someone talked about uh, sort of time costs to communities. And so we're conscious of that both for the researchers and the institutions in the communities that um, it needs to um, facilitate those things as much as possible. Yeah. Sorry, sure. let's go, Neil. Last comment, and then we'll have to finish the finish the panel. Yeah, sorry, sorry for joining. That. I just just I like that the provenance and the purpose. I think that's a really in, provenance is where it's come from. I'm thinking of a Gauguin painting right now, but. It's where it came from, where we are today, and where we're going. And there's only one place, well, it came from something, we should be able to document that. Where we're going, there are many purposes. But where we can go is, the, along the way, there are these contracts, which is a social context of what could we do with this? What do we intend to do? What, what do we want to do with it? And that opens up. But then you have to revisit visit that as you go forward and actually see where you are, because there are new roads that appear before you. Right, so I like that provenance to purpose. It's very yeah. interesting. Yeah. I think that's a prescient way to finish this panel. I think that uh, what's so important about all of this is that it, it, we don't know because it hasn't been done before. It wasn't done. And so now we're in this position of kind of rethinking what that could mean and what those futures could look like um, if we do consider provenance and Indigenous rights and interests seriously um, in relationship to data and what that means. 
So on that note, I want to thank everyone who has um, been part of this panel today. Thank you for joining us. I want to especially thank all the um, speakers and panelists. Um, I want to remind everyone that this was uh, recorded and will be available at later dates. Um, there were some great questions. Kate, I wanted to come to your question, uh, but we didn't have time. But please put it into the um, the the Google Doc so that we can kind of main, maintain a continued conversation around this. I want to let you know that the next session that's coming up is uh, actually I don't know what the next session that's coming up is. It's asking. It's a social hour. <laughs> so it's a social hour. That sounds particularly good. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you all again for joining us today and starting this conversation, which uh, we think is pretty important. And uh, please feel free to share this recording with your colleagues as well. Thank you, everyone.